always loved the regattas. We never missed a regatta. We always loved it wherever there was boats, because we'd been brought up with boats in Rivenhoe, really, you know, it used to be lovely. Lovely swam, which I, I do remember very vividly on the old quay here, the varnish being used on these lovely uh, motor launches and that. And that was, a, and I can still sort of smell that now. Yeah, it's a nice thing. If you were on the tinning side, you would, the tins would cut the ends of your fingers, very sharp. So you used to come away where there were lots of little cuts on the ends of your fingers, which used to be very sore, which was rather wide, rather grey, because I was quick and I could earn a bit more at that. Everybody was really proud of what they did. It's a wonderful experience to think that you could shape metal from that to that to that in one in one bit of plate. Couldn't you thought, well, hmm, I've done all that. Or I'll, my old mate done that bit down there. Each year the regatta at Wivenhoe attracts hundreds of people to a celebration of sailing and riverside ambience. The pursuit of leisure seems the main activity on the quayside now, but for much of the 20th century it was a place of work. Shipbuilding and fishing dominated the life of this Essex village, situated on the east bank of the River Cone, a few miles from the Thames estuary and the North Sea. But despite many changes in the fortunes of the community, the close proximity to water has continued to shape the character of Wivenhoe. In the 1920s and 30s, Wivenhoe was a community of 2,000 people living in the old village by the river or in the newer houses beyond the railway line. For children, this meant you were either an upstreeter or a downstreeter. I'm a downstreeter always because I've, I've lived in the house where I am now all my life and oh yes we were downstreeters yeah very proud of it. <laughs> I was very much a downstreeter. I suppose us downstreeters we, we you know because if you lived above uh, the Grosvenor then uh, you were an upstreet and I, I think there was something a little bit uh, moving up the social scale about being a, an upstreeter and uh, and, and that really was what got young lads like us, we didn't want to move up the social scale. I suppose we wanted to be the scruffs down by the river. There was always the upstreeters and the downstreeters with the upstreeters, yes. I don't know whether they thought we were better than them or not, I don't know. We never really fathomed that one out. We just thought, oh, well, we're the upstreeters, and that was that. We used to laugh about it. I think we didn't think we took it seriously anyway. If you were a downstreeter, well, you thought you were the best because you were where the shops were, you were where the school was. Um, they thought they were best because they'd got a lot of open area up there where they could go and play. Mm, weren't allowed to mix. I think my mother thought she was top drawer. <laughs> Wherever they lived in Wivenhoe, children were drawn to the river, a constant source of danger with drownings reported every year. My cousin bought up an old ferry boat and he got a motorbike engine put on the back and we used to go down the river. And honestly, he could swim, he was a strong swimmer, but we couldn't, but you didn't think about it. No, I couldn't swim. <laughs> couldn't swim for toffee. <laughs> I never wanted to swim. We were gliding in the water and I went to stand up and of course there was no water there. Yeah, it was all water couldn't do anything, screamed and shouted and a friend was, you know, holding on to me, we're pulling each other down. And a boat comes along, he heard us shouting and he pulled us in and uh, brought the water up from us and it got in the local papers that two local girls nearly drowned in river. Of course I hadn't told my father, had I? The well-being of Wivenhoe relied on generations of families closely associated with the water. Names such as Sainty,
gun and green prevailed amongst the narrow streets along the quay. Charlie Sainty ran the ferry service to Fingering Hoe in the 1920s. He was a busy man, but always happy to help future generations of seafarers, such as his nephew, Ernie Vince. It was through him I got on the water as much as anything, really, because when he owned a ferry, if he was indoors at the time a customer arrived, I, would, I got to the stage where I was good enough to jump in the boat and row and get them. And he let that go on, and that was a, a good help to my start of really getting on the water. And I, by then I had made, made up my mind that's where I was going. Traditionally, most skippers on the East Anglian coast had a nickname. Friday Green would not set out fishing on a Friday if poor weather had prevented an earlier start to his working week. He was a very big man and a very strong man, and um, he was also the fighting man of Wyvern Hoe, and uh, you know, when uh, he was in various ports because he was very active up and down the East Coast. And, um, the way to pick a fight in those days was to drink someone's beer. You see, that was a direct challenge, and uh, he could never resist a challenge. So uh, he was—he quite often had his beer drunk for him, and uh, that was a fight. He was a crew member of the early America's Cup yachts. He was also apprenticed to uh, Captain Carter, who actually was captain of um, King George V's yacht, and that was what brought him into Wivenhoe because he came into Wivenhoe on the the Carter family smack, and um, that's how I am here now, I suppose, because uh, my family now have been here for three or four generations. George V later chose another renowned fisherman from Withenhoe to Captain Britannia. Albert Turner's acumen, though, was as a daring winner of races. In 1928, Captain Turner picked Ben Blackwood from Withenhoe to join the Britannia crew. This was to be his daughter Joyce's first association with sailing. When I was born, he was on the Britannia, and I was born on his birthday, and I believe Captain Turner was at home at that weekend, and when he went back and told the crew that Ben had had a daughter, and Ben had to, you know, cough up drinks all round for, <laughs> for the crew then. Ben Blackwood was irregular with the crews of the big steam yachts, still popular with wealthy bankers and industrialists in the early 20th century. As a stoker, he had to supplement his pay by mending crewmen's clothes, but he chose to live in Wivenhoe because of its reputation for yachting. The depth of the cone at high tide, together with the shipbuilding yards, had given Wivenhoe the edge for mooring and fitting out steam yachts. favourite of Withenhoe was the Rosabal. At 640 tonnes, she was the largest of five generations of Rosabal yachts, owned by stockbroker Theodore Pym. Amongst his 28 crewmen were Ben Blackwood and deck boy Ernie Vince. We were a number of you in crew, you each had a section of the ship to look after. That was your, that was your responsibility. As a deck boy, first thing in the day, normally, was Scrubbing decks, polishing brass work, getting the varnish work cleaned and bright. Pym's summertime cruises meant much to the community of Wivenhoe. When the yachts were due to go uh, off for the season, uh, the children were allowed out of school early if it was an afternoon tide, which it very often was. They uh, used to, you know, make it so that they went away late afternoon. The day used to come. The, the buzz would go round, all the Roosevelt's going away tomorrow, you know, half past two or two or whatever. And uh, we used to go down there uh, and watch and wait. The owner, um, he used to set aside some money to be given to the boys and the girls um, as the boat was going. And, uh, and one year my mother had to uh, dole that out. There was always more for the boys than there was for the girls. A bosun or somebody would come ashore and he'd dish out few pennies and pence to everybody. The cruises could last up to four months at a time. I know we missed him, but um, it seemed to be every time he went, it was an adventure that he was um, going on. 
Oh, she was a good old sea bird. We got caught there a couple of times, which we, we didn't, I didn't worry her much. But uh, I was allowed to take my first steering trip as we were going up the Mediterranean. Bit steer, singing that big long thing in front of you. And <laughs> your job to keep it straight. <laughs> but there again, the big schooner at the Sunbeam was the most thrilling. When you've got everything set on her uh, and a breeze of wind, you were enjoying life. <laughs> I, I just thought that was a lovely life. If I'd have been a boy at that time, <laughs> I think I'd have done the same. Such was the respect afforded Wyvern Ho Cruise that another wealthy yacht owner, Captain Charles Nottage, bequeathed money for the teaching of navigation. Since it was established in 1895, the Nottage Institute has broadened its activities to include boat building, reflecting the craft's place in Wivenhoe's maritime history. Don Smith joined in 1963. It was my interest in, in in Wivenhoe's heritage of boat building and all that sort of thing. It was always in the back of my mind, you know. And you, you learned a lot from this, this boat building. Working with your hands and that, doing a bit of the carpentry side of it. At Husks, they'd been crafting boats from wood ever since the 1840s in a yard sighted downstream from the quay. By contrast, upstream of the quay, men at forests worked with steel. In 1920, the company launched the 1,400-tonne Mainly Transport, the largest ship ever built at Wivenhoe. It was a legacy of men like these shipwrights that the Nottage aspired to preserve. I was the first chap to bring an electric drill here because it all used to be handwork, you know, and I brought it along Black and Decker. When it came to launching, uh, I was extremely, extremely proud of it. The skill base of shipwrights at Wivenhoe was matched by the passion for sailing. Lewis Wasp, seen here with Don Smith at the Nottage, had been a sailor all his life. In 1926, he was involved with establishing the Wivenhoe Sailing Club. And later, in 1935, he encouraged Dr. Walter Radcliffe to devise the Wivenhoe One Design sailing boat. Although these boats became an icon of sailing at Wivenhoe, only 19 were ever made. My father had had a, uh, a Wivenhoe One design built, and that was built in 1936 by Mitchells at uh, Brightlingsea. Number 17 Ely's, which was named after grandfather's smack. So I learned to sail with him at a very early age. Um, in the learning process, I capsized Ely's twice, and you, you didn't jump out the boat and stand on the keel in those days. When, when the Women O One design capsized, that was the end of you as a race was concerned, and uh, uh, all you were concerned about was, was not drowning. Skills at sailing and a hunger for making a living are the qualities needed for fishing. In the early 1930s, Lewis Wars operated three fishing smacks from Rivenhoe, where the depth of the comb and the closeness of North Sea sprats provided a viable base. Mr. Wasp was to give Ernie Vince his first job as a skipper on the brand new Christine, but Ernie had perfected his skills for catching sprats on sailing smacks still in use when he started fishing in 1926, aged 14. In those days, you went by the use of the birds, the gulls and so on, because wherever the sprats were, the, the gulls were there in thousands. If you thought you'd found a spot underneath them that you might be lucky, then you've got your gear, your, your net things all ready, let go your anchors, drop your nets underneath, and, and help the result would be what you wanted. <laughs> Sailing smacks ceased to be used at Wivenhoe from the early 1930s. They were replaced by motorised boats, soon owned by all the fishing families. 15-year-old Ken Green started work on his Uncle Ernie's boat 
in 1949. Sprats uh, came over the side three or four bushels at a time and uh, if you'd got a catch of 300 bushels for instance that, which was a good catch then uh, you can work out that you were going to make about 100 lifts over the side. Each time you wanted to get some on board, you worked a quantity from the sleeve down into the tail end. Then you'd haul that tail end aboard, work the next lot down, so, and it, it wasn't light work. Once the catch had been hauled aboard, the speed was of the essence. The reason that we were racing into a port was to try to get there first uh, so that you could actually get unloaded first because if you got unloaded first then you can get out again and uh, hopefully find some more sprats. To unload the catch at Wivenhoe, boats had to face bow into the quay and the fish carried down a gangplank in bushel-sized baskets. The catch would be eagerly awaited by Ken's father and Uncle Edwin, both fishmongers. We would land about two o'clock and of course it's Uncle Ernie who's actually caught the sprat, so if uh, Uncle Edwin required a bushel and the father required a bushel, well then they would have them and buy them off them and uh, father would be selling his in Colchester and Uncle Edwin would be selling his in Wivenhoe. Edwin Green had been selling sprats from his fish shop in Wivenhoe since 1920, but all varieties of fish were in demand. Lovely fresh fish. And the fried fish at the fish shop you was only two pence, two old pennies, for quite a big bit of fish, and a penny worth of chips was a meal. Each fish or seafood had its season. For sprats, this was between October and Christmas, a time of year eagerly anticipated by many families in the village during the 1930s. Sprats, they were lovely. My mother would cook them in the kitchen in, in a big, pan and they'd be lovely and crisp and brown and she'd bring them in on a big dish and you had the dish in the middle of the table and you helped yourself to these sprats. You hold the head in one hand and the tail in the other and well, a bit like a mouth organ really. You'd work your way along and eat one side and then turn it over and eat the other and you were left with the skeleton. The shrimps in the summer were lovely. Well they were so fresh the skins just came off and if you don't have them fresh the same day they caught, the skins won't come off and they're salty. Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. A half pint of shrimps did three people. In any one season, much of Wivenhoe's economy depended on the quantity of fish available. When they were there and there was market, it was a good trade. You could earn quite a comfortable living out of it. But the market for sprats was vulnerable to saturation. Very often you could pick up a bucket of sprats uh, for nothing. You know, they, they dumped them on the quay, which they were going to take them away for um, fertiliser, I suppose. What people didn't realise was that a heap of sprats on the quay represented a wonderful romantic way of life, but it was disastrous for the fishermen because it meant they couldn't sell their catches. During the 1920s, shipbuilding and fishing gave Wivenhoe a certain stability, boosted by the presence of the big yachts. But life in the village retained a rural simplicity with few modern conveniences. Marjorie Goldstraw's family lived in Black Boy Cottage. Black Boy Cottage, it was sort of one up and one down and an underground kitchen. Very difficult <laughs> and... Uh, to get to the toilet, which we shared with the local midwife, uh, you went down a concrete passage. And uh, my mother used to dare me to want to go to the toilet because of the effort of going down the underground kitchen and along the concrete passage, if it was raining, was a bit... <laughs> so, you know, you were asked not to want to go too often. Joyce Blackwood's family lived in Queen's Road, where her mother often had to run the household alone. We had a kitchen range in the living room, and that produced some 
wonderful stuff, um, dependent a lot on which way the wind was blowing because uh, of the, you know, the chimney, the flue and things like that. So she knew which day we were going to have a good Yorkshire pudding or we weren't because, she said, oh, you know, the wind's in the wrong direction today. A mother's weekly workload in Wivenhoe started with washing on a Monday. Tuesday, oh, um, ironing day, ironing definitely, had to get that all done. Tuesday they had an old mangle, you know, with wooden rollers and they mangled the sheets and the towels, you didn't need ironing. And Wednesday I think was housekeeping day where you had to clean stairs and bedrooms. In 1928 Marjorie's mother moved the family to Anglesey Road. The houses here had been built for captains complete with their own sail lofts, but there were no bathrooms. Only two tin baths that my mother did the washing in to have a bath in, and that was Friday night, and uh, there was a half-inch gap in the scullery door into the yard outside, and the wind used to whistle through there in the winter when you <laughs> had this bath. We used to hang coats over the door. It was dreadful. And you know, your knees were on, up to your chin, you know. And uh, Saturday nights was the um, night soil man who emptied the lavatories. Up to the early 1930s, Wivenhoe had no main sewerage system, relying instead on a collection of waste. Grandfather worked the night soil, and I understand he was on there some 20 years. And they used to go out at night, him and another fella, and they'd go all round the different cottages and that uh, and uh, take this large container from, the, uh, from the, the toilet at the back, at the bottom of the garden, and deposit it in, into the wagon. They tell me he had a very short temper and um, he would have to lift this container and put it on his shoulder sort of thing and walk down a garden path or anything. Well, in those days, people had these linen lines which ran sort of parallel with the paths. And if a linen line or anything on it was in his way, he had very bad temper. And he always carried a knife and he'd cut the darn thing. <laughs> you know, no matter what was on the line, he cut it. And that was George Watcham. At the age of 13, Sylvia Wetherill's family moved to a small house down on the quay, part of a row of houses known as the Folly. But life so close to the river could be rough, for every year spring tides brought flooding. We did uh, live right onto the water, the house facing the water at the Folly. And uh, when the, you get the signal to say that it's going to come in, you just grab everything you've got and get upstairs. That's about all you can do because that comes in with quite a force and the water used to come through the front door, up the side passage of the house and into the back door. So you had water going in two ways and it used to come up to four foot I suppose, sometimes more because the stairs, it used to come up, creep up the stairs so when you ran up the stairs the first four or five stairs were covered with water. The houses further down the folly towards Cook's yard used to get it even worse than us. They must have had it up to their ceilings. They must have done. You couldn't carry everything upstairs, could you? It was a little narrow staircase. You just couldn't carry everything up. So they had to stay down there and get wet. Your, your mind is on what you need to have, isn't it? And so you just grab whatever you can. I mean, is your, your food. Uh, and you just left what you couldn't take and then you just survived upstairs until the tide went out and then you could come down again. The river was terrible, dreadful smell. You just had to sweep it out the door. Um, all the uh, debris and what came, bits of wood or whatever came in. Rats as well if they came up. You've only got an open fire to dry everything with. I mean, everything was damp. I mean, your clothes, everything was damp. Even your bedrooms felt damp. It used to get me down. It would, uh, it would depress you, you know, to think, oh God, why am I living like this? And other people are living a nicer life, but um, 
awful. Just pray to get out of somewhere different, somewhere decent. Sylvia Wetherill lived in the Folly for five years. Those houses which suffered the worst had been demolished by the early 1960s, but the problem of tidal flooding in Wivenhoe was not solved until the barrier was built in 1994. During the 1920s, Wivenhoe's shipyards went through various ownerships, each change decreasing the number of men in work. But though the yards managed to keep going into the 1930s, the Depression brought a sustained period of unemployment in the village. In 1937, shipbuilding in Wivenhoe had ceased and Forrest's old dry dock became derelict. These were harsh years for the Riverside community. The Depression came in the 30s and there was no work and, and uh, you only drew so much dole and then you went on to what they called the transitional. And when that ran out, they came to look at your furniture, like bailiffs, to see what they could take. Oh, it was dreadful. I know when Dad was on the dole, uh, he wasn't, uh, he told us he couldn't be out of the house after, uh, I think it was seven o'clock in the evening. He'd got to be in, like a curfew. He had to um, make sure that uh, he wasn't seen on the streets at those times. Mother hadn't got the shillings to put in the meter, so she filed halfpennies down and put them in the meter. And when the electric light man came round, he wanted a hundred shillings and he got a hundred filed halfpennies, which wasn't very clever. So off went the lights. So we're then stuck with an oil lamp. And the only thing you got to cook on was an open fire. Despite the family's poverty, Bill Gibson would often risk losing his job confronting authority. He was always a builder's labourer and um, he was mixing some cement and the work uh, bosses were there and that. Mr Gooch came up and he said, good morning Mr Clark, good morning Mr Dobson to all the gentlemen there and said, good morning Gibson to my father and he just turned around and said, good morning Gooch. So my father was like that. He didn't, he didn't, if he upset somebody, it was hard cheese. For families with little money, food often became a matter of invention. We were always well fed, but I know my mother has said in some of the terraces that the neighbours would come out and shake the cloth to make out they'd had a meal and they hadn't, you know, so the neighbours wouldn't talk they had in that shop um, some very, very heavy stuff which I think was made from all the old stale cakes and it was called Philbelly and you could buy a halfpenny slice of Philbelly if you'd got a halfpenny to spare. My mother just didn't seem to have the money to be able to help us, you know, to give us food. And um, I can remember going down to Steve Hall's, which was a shop in Queen Street, and my mother saying, get four bananas. And um, I bought these bananas and I thought on the way coming up, I'm going to have one of them, I'm hungry. So I ate it, but when I got home I said to Mum, didn't like that banana. Didn't like it, she said, bananas are lovely. I'd eaten it with the skin on, which wasn't very nice. <laughs> but I was hungry, yes, yeah. Uh, you could go to the butcher and get a half a sheep's head and that made it two or three dinners, the brains and everything, and there was meat on the cheeks, soaked it overnight in a bucket, and uh, sixpence, old money, would buy enough meat for a pudding. It was going back to friends, really, uh, people giving you food. Uh, the mother said, uh, you, you know, you like something to eat, Sylvia, and I said, yes, I'm hungry. And out came this lovely pie out of the oven and I sat and ate it and uh, I said what was in the pie and they said sparrows so we had sparrow pie for tea well, I enjoyed it it was very nice the outbreak of war in 1939 ironically became a good thing for Wivenhoe for it brought back shipbuilding and badly needed jobs Forrest's old site became Wivenhoe Shipyard Limited, with orders for wooden minesweepers, while Vospers built motor torpedo boats downstream. 
But for the first time in Wivenhoe's history, women entered the shipyards. Government legislation demanded that women aged over 20 must register for war work. Riveter Ernest Hatch was now to be accompanied on the riverside by his two younger daughters, Ellen and Edith. I was coming up to 21 at the time and they wanted some girls in the joinery shop and that really took our fancy, I think, doing woodwork. So me and my sister went to see if we'd get a job and we got a job. At the beginning of the 21st century, it is not common to find women building boats. But when Ellen Prim and her sister Edith started at Vosper's joinery workshop in 1942, they very much entered a man's world. The men treated us wonderfully well. You can, we could honestly say, my sister said she was surprised because she thought that they might, might resent us being in the joiner shop, but they were ever so good. They helped us with it the, because they had to tell us what to do and they helped us with the job and they were, they were wonderful people, they really were. Yeah. Okay. We've got the knack of using all the tools, really. I rather like planing because that was very interesting, you know, because I used to plane away and I was singing to myself all the time. And it, was, it, was, it was really quite, it was quite an interesting job doing planing, I think. There's an art to that, really. You don't realise till you do it, you know. When there was a launch, we, always, we were always allowed to go to the launch. And they said, oh, we didn't have to work. And so we were allowed out on the quay and we watched all the procedure, which was lovely, really to see them sliding down into the river and to think you were part of them, you'd done your little bit. And I think it was a lovely feeling, really, you know. They were beautiful boats, they really were. They are much bigger than I expected them to be, you know, because when we, you're working on them, you don't take that much notice, but seeing them glide down into the water, they were quite big boats, really. There was so much work to be done during the war, you see, building these boats, especially the ones we built at Vospers, the motor torpedo boats, and they'd no soon been on active service and they were blown to pieces. They were only, ma only mahogany wood. We knew that we'd have to go back to our normal job afterwards because they wouldn't keep us on. And we went back to our tailoring after the war. I was a bit disappointed and I think my sister was too because we thoroughly enjoyed doing something different really, you know. It was a, it was a wonderful job really, you know. During the post-war years, British shipbuilding was much in demand, and Wivenhoe, with its two yards, became busier than ever. James W. Cook & Co. from London took over Vosper's downstream site in 1947. The barges and ships it produced were made using steel plates and rivets. For apprentices like John Bynes, who joined Cook's in 1949, it was a tough work environment. You um, basically looked after your plater. Um, the old saying is, if you're more than three foot away, boy, you're, you're in the wrong place. But like all boys, apprentice boys, we were cheeky little sods at the time, I suppose. Um, one, one of the old platers there, Dick Crow, he lost his hair. And that all came out in little tufts. And uh, we, we used to call him Tufty, and he, he, he used to chase us around like anything. We used to be 14 and 28 pound hammers to swing there, so you can see the kind of guys. Um, and they'd take great delight in, in doing that on your muscle there and turning it. And <laughs> you'd get two or three times a day to somebody do that to you, it, 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 it hurts. Orders were so good that cooks had to bring in extra riveters from Gateshead. You tried to keep abreast of things, but you never did, so the riveters um, the Geordies used to say, put mine in, boy, for half a crown, or half a dollar, as they used to say. Um, so you know who got the line, their line is in first, the one who was paying the half a crown. I mean, the, the local boys wouldn't pay it. I mean, uh, one old boy, Jim Saws, signing his shores, he, he chased me around the ship with a hammer. A riveter in those days was, um, he had to put in 1,300 rivets to earn a week's wages. The easiest ones were on the side of the ship, the hardest ones were under the bottom of the ship, and the next hardest ones were on the deck. Riveters was a hard, hard, harsh life, and the boat always stunk of wee, because directly they'd finish riveting, the majority of them peed over the rivets. The holder up inside the ship, 
make certain that they were they rusted up watertight. Dawn on the Cone at Wivenhoe has always been a placid scene. But in the early 1950s, the village started its day with a very particular sound. Well, first thing would be the hooter in the morning, um, 5 and 20 past 7. Um, it would blow, you could hear it all over Wivenhoe. Um, I've been biking in on, on my bike um, at Wivenhoe Cross and heard that hooter go. But, well, I've, got, I've got eight minutes, five minutes to get there, and we were allowed three minutes. So I've got eight minutes to get down from the top end of Wivno down to the yard, and then the hooter would go at half past seven to start work. They must have knocked off at about midday, I think, because there was a siren. That meant they could down tools, and then again in the evening. So I do very much remember that. And then two or few minutes later, all the bicycles, you know, r rushing back for lunch and back again. Yes, it was, it, it was noisy. During working hours, Wivenhoe resonated the unmistakable sound of riveting. A bit like a machine gun, I suppose. Sort of da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, you'd hear it all the time because we lived quite near, you see. Health issues at work were only just beginning to be recognised in early post-war Britain. There was about 14 squads of riveters at one time. Oh. The noise was horrific, and I, along with a couple more boys, put cotton wool in her ears to stop the noise, and they got on to us like billio. Get out of your ears, boy, you won't need that. You've got to get used to it. It's something you've got to live with all your life. Well, your, your ears used to actually ring when that, no when that noise I mean, because it never stopped. When one finished a rivet and you were waiting for the next one, the next one was going. Ernest Hatch had been a riveter on the cone for more than 50 years. He was deaf for years, my dad. He went deaf quite young, and my mum used to say she reckoned that was a constant hammering that affected his eardrums, I think. He used to come home covered in burns with the rock from the red-hot rivets, and I said, I wouldn't want to do a job like that. <laughs> but he'd always done it, you know, that, that job, right from a boy, I think, really. Both shipyards booming, the quayside at Wivenhoe in the 1950s was once more a hive of activity. Fishing had picked up, and Lewis Warsp's cannery now employed over 150 women. Although Sylvia Weatherall had moved out of the folly, her life still remained close to the water after she took a job at North Sea Canners. I was on the, um, the grading, and we had a, a grid like that in front of us with all grooves in it. And you had to grade the fish, so you pick them up by size. And you've got a lot of fish dumped in front of you, and you pick them up by size, that or that or that. And you had a frame in front of you, and you put, you put these fish in these grooves by size. And then you put a rod through their eyes, and then you hung them up on the frame. So you did a frame of big ones, and then when you were left with the medium ones, you did a frame of medium ones, then you did a frame of small ones. So that's how that was done. And then um, you had another lot of women putting the fish into the tins. One man cutting the heads and the tails off of the uh, sardines so the ladies could put them in the tins. I earned four pound a week wages and four pound, three or four pounds on, on bonus. So I was fairly quick, really but Sylvia still found she had to supplement her wages. I was hungry anyway, and I thought, well, I there's not much for tea tonight, so uh, I will uh, have myself a tin of sardines. So I just I'd put it in my pocket and, uh, and walk out and, and, and have a, a tin of salmon as well. If, uh, if there was one going, I'd have a tin of salmon. It wasn't too often. You'd do it now and again, you know. didn't have to go into Colchester for anything. You wanted a posh hat for a wedding, 
we, there was a milliner and two banks and everything, you know, that you needed. At one time we had butchers and bakers and grocers and everything at the bottom of the village. Wivenow was quite, in 1950s, was quite a bustling little place with the cook's yard and the other shipyard and the fish factory. It was much more sort of working than it is now. You know, you, you mustn't get in their way and they, they, it was busy. It was a proper working place. Cooks flourished at Wivenhoe with orders for ships from all over the world. But by the 1960s, riveting had been superseded by welding and new work practices introduced. Plater John Bimes was at the forefront of the squad system at Cooks. His colleagues called him the Admiral. That was my intention in life, to make money. Um, and people began to look up to that because he made money and we didn't. Um, and, and he made money with, cool, look what the squad he's got. Um, but that was just a case of organising. We only made £128 between us, but shared out between, between all of us, that wasn't too bad. It was just lift, lift, lift all the time up to about, I mean, you'd probably lift um, 200 weight, 300 weight on your own without a crane. If somebody else had got the crane and you couldn't wait, you'd lift it. It could be anything up to six months before the ships were ready to be launched. We were the onboard party. Um, we laid out ropes. Um, we used to stretch them across the river and onto the end of the um, jetty. So the boat was going down, and then we had one down river which would spin the boat. When as soon as it got afloat, the rope would come taut, and uh, you'd get a rope about, say, four-inch diameter would go down, <laughs> would go down to about an inch in stretch, and then the, when the boat turned, that come back upright. It was, you know, you used to stand on the deck and think, "Is it going to break? Is it going to break?" Big launches, you could probably get three, four hundred people down there from, you know, all round. Um, they'd be right within, say, six or eight foot from the boat when that was being launched. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful spectacle for them. You, you know, you, people used to tell you in the street, God, came down and saw the boat launch last week. What a wonderful do it was. Um, you know, it was, it, it was a great day in the yard. We all had a bottle of beer. <laughs> Or perhaps two. But the existence of heavy industry in Wivenhoe could also bring tragedy. Accidents do happen and shipyards are one of the worst places for accidents, you know, the, the pure nature of what we do in shipyards is you're always going to get people killed. Um, my my um, labourer, he got killed on a boat and um, we were lifting a plate one Friday afternoon. It came out of the grab and uh, slipped and killed him. Could have killed three of us. You know, there was there was three of us there in front of the plate when it rolled out. It was a rolled plate the, the, where it came off the hold and went up to the stern of the boat. Probably weighed about two tonne, you know. It, if that hit any of us, that would have killed us. Another guy got killed, squashed in the plate racks. Um, very, very unfortunate. Um, nobody missed him till about seven o'clock at night. And his wife thought he was doing something else and then rung somebody else up and said, oh, um, Fred working tonight? He said, no. So they went back down the yard and found him squashed in the plate racks. It was terrible at the time, um, really bad. The working community of Wivenhoe had long enjoyed sailing as a sport and pastime. And for those people who did not sail, there was always the regatta. And obviously there are no rules about which, which direction you need to uh, go around the boy in. Um, I think there are... Between 1856 and 1914, 
Women Her Regattas were held annually in September when the crews returned from racing or cruising the big yachts. The First World War broke this tradition until the sailing club revived the event in 1936. Now moved to the end of July, the regatta instantly became the high point of the year for all. There was not much else of entertainment in the village, but the regatta was something which you looked forward to every year. And there would be um, boat uh, races for boats, there would be rowing races, there would be pool devil, pool baker, which was soot and flour and greasy pole and um, all sorts of exciting things for those on the quay um, to watch. And it was something that the whole village took part in. Wivenhoe's regatta was interrupted again during wartime, but by the 1950s had got back up to speed. The sailing club, though, had problems finding an organiser until Ernie Vince took control. I organised them for several years. That was interesting and good fun doing it. And it wasn't really difficult in a, in a sense because you knew what you wanted. It was getting the, getting the things you wanted put together, as the saying is, ready for the day, so that things went off smoothly. I, I never had any problems. Which one is it? Oxford or Cambridge? Which one are we going for here? Oxford! Spectators have always enjoyed the fun and games of the regattas, but for most participants, there is only one reason for being on the water, sailing and one of the most respected sailors in Wivenhoe in the 1960s was Charlie Sainty. Like his father, Charlie, who had taught Ernie Vince to sail four decades before, the junior Charlie Sainty knew the river at Wivenhoe intimately. Charlie uh, had a boat um, called the Vigia, and um, he would, uh, as, as soon as the Vigia floated, most, most days Charlie would be aboard and he would sail down the river and he'd, he'd have a sail. He really did enjoy that boat. He was one of the characters. He worked in Cook's shipyard and um, if the tide was favourable, Charlie would knock off and early and go for a sail. <laughs> also like his father, Charlie Saint, he loved to teach others what he knew about sailing. This time the pupil was Joyce Blackwood. We had a, a good tutor in um, a, a man called Charlie Sainty, who had boats all his life, and he used to take us with him on his boat and tell us what to look for and how to watch the sails and watch the water and, you know, he'd watch that little ripple on the water, you'll know where the breeze is coming from. And um, so we'd learn to sail. Um, he was a man with a tremendous sense of humour and I think very often he sailed um, in his birthday suit because he wouldn't stand up to let anybody see, see him when he was out on that boat. But um, he knew what to do in a boat and that was where we all, well, we learned from because he really knew what he was doing. Joyce now sails a 26-foot saddler with Pat Ellis, but in the late 1960s and early 70s she was learning how to manoeuvre much smaller boats. As a woman, it could be difficult to gain first-hand experience. There were lots of women sailing, but not many helming in dinghies in those days. When we had ladies' races, the man would crew for you so that um, uh, you helmed, but he would tell you, you know, what to do. So that really was a great help when uh, you were still in the process of learning. And to start sailing at Wivenhoe, I think, is a good grounding for anybody because you had Rose Lane, you'd got the Ferry Hard, you'd got other places where there were like funnels of um, air coming through so that um, you'd got to cope with those as you were uh, starting. And, of course, the uh, river there is very narrow and uh, it was always said that if you could sail at Wivenhoe, you could sail anywhere. Most sailors wanted to try a Wivenhoe One design. I did sail in a Wivenhoe One design. Very heavy boat to sail. Um, 
and a very, very heavy centre plate to manage. Uh, you have to crouch down too to get under the um, boom when you when you come about. I wouldn't personally say it's a very comfortable boat to sail, but um, uh, it's a pleasing little boat to look at. And uh, we had some good times in it. I used to go in the ladies' races in in um, uh, Women Ho One Design. As the 1960s progressed into the 70s. Wivenhoe began to change. The villagers started to buy cars to take them to shops in Colchester and even to work within Wivenhoe itself. In line with many similar sized villages in Britain, the place became less self sufficient and more like a residential community. It was clear that Wivenhoe's fishing industry did not generate the sort of revenue of former decades. But Ken Green still saw a business opportunity in buying a powerful fishing boat. Uh, advertised in the fishing news was this boat from Northern Ireland, which had just been re-engined with a brand new uh, Rolls-Royce engine and uh, 150 horse, which was a lot of horsepower in those days for these boats. Golden Dawn was about uh, 54 feet long and bigger than the smacks that we'd been used to. And um, we spoke to Ernie Vince, who would. Uh, always um, uh, uh, been a, a, a yachting skipper and a fishing skipper and, uh, and he said that he would skip at the boat for us. Golden Dawn, that was the last one I had, the big smack, she was a big one. Yeah, she was the last one I had, she was a lovely ship. We caught a lot of scratches in her. I don't suppose that she ever operated profitably if, she, if we stood her alone within the business. But of course she gave the, the retail side of the business a, a tremendous boost. We featured her on our carrier bags and uh, on our wrapping bags and things like that. And uh, it was a very good boost. It was, and from a romantic point of view too, we'd got another boat, we'd got a boat in the business. In contrast to fishing, the business of making money from shipbuilding in Wivenhoe seemed to be improving. In the early 1980s, cooks were producing bigger and bigger ships, but in 1985, the workforce began to realise that orders for two particular ships had put the company in danger. They were really big ships for, for us and for the river. You didn't realise until probably you were halfway through that, that they were stretching the firm. Um, you know, we used to talk to the people in the office and you would say, um, cool, we're doing well. And they'd say, well, you know, you know you're not. There's, these, are, these, these jobs are taking a lot of money and taking a lot of expense out of the yard and um, we're not going to complete them on time and we're not going get to them, get them done. By October, cooks were ready to launch the Lord Nelson, a square-rigged schooner designed for training handicapped sailors. What had seemed a prestigious order, though, ran into contractual problems that the shipyard could not absorb. On the 18th of May, 1986, James W. Cook and Company went into liquidation. John Bynes had the task of informing his colleagues that they were being made redundant. The longest guy who was the electrician who had been there, he started in um, August 48. The yard opened in 47. He started in 48. Um, he was the maintenance electrician, Eric Sparling. Um, I, it was te it was one of the worst days of my life, having to give him that envelope. He, Sorry, Eric, mate. He said, well, what about this? What about this? Eric? I said, he said, it's the end, mate. I said, we're going in a few weeks. I said, you're lucky you're gone now. I said, we've got to stay to the bitter end. The yard formally closed on September the 6th, 1986. I mean, there was only about six of us left, um, and uh, the joiner shop charge and the foreman he locked his shop up. Um, the um, the shipwrights there was only one, two left of the shipwrights, and they just left the door open. So I I slammed the door and uh, walked over, and there was another little what we used to call Husky's house. Um, put the lock on that, walked into the other bit and walked over and then locked the stores up and um, 
bunch of keys in and I took them into the main office and gave them to the manager and said, there you are, all yours now. So he said, yeah, I know. He said, sad old doing it. So I said, yeah. And you think, we all stood there. <laughs> we ain't got a job. We can't come back here no more. Just wonder what you're going to do, you know. I mean, I hadn't got a clue what I was going to do. Been in the shipyard all my me, all me life, 38 years. And you'd always go on a Monday, on a Monday morning, you know. You'd got up and gone to work. Um, that Monday morning, I got up, I hadn't got a job. The closing of Cook's meant the end of an era for Wyvern Hoe. Shipbuilding never returned, and from the mid-1980s onwards, other companies have gradually left the quayside. Twenty years after its demise, the last signs of shipbuilding in Wivenhoe have been removed. Houses on the Folly, once subject to regular flooding, have been saved by the barrier, and the appearance of the quayside transformed as industrial space becomes residential. Virtually the only boat building in Wivenhoe now is at the Nottage Maritime Institute. Here, the skills in practice are the same as those used at Husks 80 years ago. The work goes on partly because people feel a need to keep a symmetry with the past. Artist James Dodd's studio overlooks Cook's former site. He arrived in Wivenhoe after its closure, but as a former shipwright, he takes great interest in the boat building heritage of the community. A lot of my pictures are past and present, and I like to incorporate boats that have long gone, or to me, the history of a place helps bring it alive. It's part of the soul of a place. Um, the uh, the liner cuts particularly I like to think of as not just a snapshot of one moment, they're a, like a memory, they are different buildings at different stages um, and you rem that's how you remember a place, you remember it by, you know, that's what that part of life slipped over and, you know, fell in or that boat there was, that had a story attached to it, you know. From a pictorial point of view, an artist's point of view, when you get a repetition of lines that evolve almost from one shape to another, it holds people's concentration. It holds, you know, it, it leads the back, the eye back into the picture. And uh, to my mind, you know, if you've got a picture on the wall, it's something that wants to hold your attention and for you to see something new each time you look at it and so on. Um, but from from a boat building point of view, there's a lot of emphasis put on this fair line, the idea of a fair line, and the boat is such a honed down kind of image that's evolved over centuries. I mean, all of the traditional shapes were never drawn, they were, they were adapted to suit the local conditions and the, the kind of materials, the kind of fishing or kind of job they're going to do. And so they have a sort of innate beauty, which is, you know, centuries old really. It's like um, stories that have been told over and over again without being written down, they can adapt and the change to fit each generation. Another shipwright who became an artist was Ernie Turner. He started painting when he retired from Cook's in 1964. His naive style is only one of many in which artists have captured Wivenhoe's maritime character. I think he saw all these people selling 
their paintings for quite large sums of money and thought, well, you know, anything you can do, I can do as well. And I think that's more or less how he started. Ernie sold some of his paintings at the Wivenhoe Arts Club. Its founder, George Gale, felt the rapidly growing number of artists in Wivenhoe needed an exhibition space and somewhere to meet. For many artists, though, this meant the pub. Colin Andrews ran the station hotel with his wife, Faye, in the early 1980s. We used to have quite an artistic uh, community and uh, uh, in particular, Mike Hurd, who was a, a great character, and we had some great fun with Mike. Mike Hurd had been painting and selling watercolours of the cone for 20 years. This is Ernie Turner's representation of the first artist to settle in Wivenhoe, Dennis Worth Miller and Richard Chopping, who came to the village in 1945. Well, Dennis, yes, he uh, very extrovert, and uh, oh, Richard's a very nice guy. He had a great sense of humour, and on occasions, uh, when Dennis was giving him a hard time, he'd come round to discuss it with us. And Faye would offer him a cup of tea, and he'd say, "Oh, you women think tea will solve everything." <laughs> Since the mid '60s, the presence of artists in Wivenhoe pubs was complemented by students and tutors from Essex University. This change reflected new trends in the community as Wivenhoe's population swelled to 10,000 after the shipyards closed. Ernie Turner bridged the gap between old and new Wivenhoe. His uncle Albert captained the Britannia. He followed his father Arthur by working as a shipwright and he became a respected Wivenhoe artist. Anything, a boat or a painting or a liner cut, to, to have any value for me has to involve your head, your heart and your hand. You know, it's the, the interaction between those three things that um, makes something interesting. And con for me, conceptual art is all in the head. You know, carpenters will run their hands across the surface to see how smooth or, you know, if it needs sanding down or... You know, you can see with your hands, you, you know, your whole body is involved with painting a painting. Um, and the same way of a boat builder, you know, there uh, is an intimate relationship making a boat. John Bynes managed to keep working in the shipbuilding industry and now in his retirement makes dinghies out of wood. It's a long process with a wooden boat. You're always in the garage doing the winter varnish and rubbing down. I'm, I'm quite enjoying myself, actually. Um, but I, I said the other night when I got in, I came in about nine o'clock, and I said, I shan't build another one. <laughs> she said, oh, yeah, 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 you wait. Somebody come along and ask you to build one, you'll go and build one. But I don't know whether I will, but it, it will give me great satisfaction. Um to see them on the water, see my granddaughters in them. Um, I should probably sail them as well. John Bynes has been an avid sailor for 30 years. In his retirement though, he's able to sail the boats he builds. Joyce Blackwood has been sailing for over 40 years. When you're sailing, it's, it's the feeling of freedom and quietness and um, exhilaration if you get a good breeze and the boat leaning over and you trying your best to you know, keep it um, upright so you can sail as fast as you can. Lovely feeling, nothing like it. That, uh, when you're out there and there are only other boats about. And events was a sailor for over 50 years. The thrill of it, I suppose, and uh, 
fighting the element, if you like to put it in, in that term, uh, beating the wind and making sure that you made full use of it when it was there and got where you wanted to. Wivenhoe may have lost its shipbuilding and much of its fishing industry, but the desire to maintain a link with the past, the timeless appeal of sailing, and the pleasures of riverside life ensure that the fortunes of Wivenhoe in the 20th century will not be forgotten.